Okay, we're going to get started with the talk in a couple of minutes. I just have a few announcements before we get started. Please silence your cell phones, but you don't need to turn them off as we'll be taking questions through Poll Everywhere and also um, Twitter if you tweet at the hashtag IST Startup. Um, at the end, we'll be asking questions, but please make sure you press uh, the black button in the desks so the people online can hear the questions. And at the end, we'll be handing out stickers for um, the passport, which you can also get if you don't have one. And if you don't want to be photographed or filmed, please stand at the back of the classroom. And finally, I have a short introduction and then we'll start. So Tad Bacasto is Director of Product Management for Digital Globe, a leading provider of geospatial information and insight. In this role, he works to incubate, launch, and grow products for Digital Globe's insight line of business, which brings together satellite imagery, geospatial data, and analytic technologies to answer critical questions for decision makers. Prior to his role, he joined Digital Globe through the acquisitions of GOI and SPADAC. At SPADAC, a leader in geospatial predictive analytics software and expertise, Todd worked closely with the founding leadership team as manager of strategic initiatives. Before joining SPADAC, Todd was an associate at FirstMark Capital, a New York-based venture capital investment firm with more than $2 billion in committed capital. At FirstMark, he identified investment opportunities in growing technology companies, executed deals, and supported the management teams at companies within FirstMark's portfolio. Prior to his experience in venture capital, Todd was an analyst in investment banking for the Media and Telecommunications Group at Merrill Lynch. Todd is a 2005 graduate of Penn State and a Schreier's Honors College with a Bachelor of Science in Information Sciences and Technology. He enjoys advising early stage companies and working with entrepreneurs. Currently, he serves on the board of directors for Inablo, a student-led startup incubator at Penn State. Please welcome Todd Bacasto. Everyone hear me? Great. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Ryan. Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, I love coming back to Penn State. It's uh, one of my favorite places to, to come back to. And for me, um, I actually grew up here, so it's, it's also, it's truly coming home. And uh, this event every year, it seems like, has gotten better and better um, in a couple ways. So um, when I started out in IST, I was part of the, the second class. And there was a lot of students initially that had startup ideas. It was kind of part of the, the dot-com boom and so forth. Um, but you know, what I observed is many students didn't really pursue startups or try to get started uh, themselves. And so what's so cool today is that seeing all the work that you guys are doing, and um, I'm just really amazed and blown away by the, the really cool things that you guys are doing. I had a chance to meet a number of you yesterday as well as uh, at the, um, there was an event last night where there were some pitches and uh, you know I think um, it's, uh, it's just really phenomenal how you guys are, are uh, you know, taking the resources you have available here at Penn State um, as well as you know, other online resources and so forth to, um, to get started. Um, so that's awesome and, and I think also you know the uh, all the speakers that come out for the event, you know, it's, it's great to see a lot of alums who have graduated, done really great things, um, I went to a lot of the talks yesterday, and have come back. Uh, so I think it's really neat to see those stories as well develop. So um, thanks for coming out on a, early on a Friday morning. Uh, this is a great turnout. So really excited to share a little bit um, about uh, how we harness startup innovation at Digital Globe and a little bit about my background. So to start things out, who can spot Waldo in this picture? Well, guess what? If you didn't already spot him, it's right in the center of the picture. So uh, you know, this is something that um, this is a problem that I'm going to revisit a couple times in my presentation. Uh, but it, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting problem to think about. But there's actually some real science behind some of the uh, the topics that I'll talk about that kind of are related to this. So. Uh, when I think about startups, um, and if I'm, you know, if, if I were in your shoes, a couple of the themes that um, that I wanted to offer um, are really these three topics. And again, these are things that I want to touch on up front, but I'll revisit throughout the presentation. So the first one, uh, from my perspective, is you know, when you think about starting a, a company, it's really, in my mind, it always starts with solving a valuable problem, right? That you're truly passionate about. So one. Um, so you want this problem to be market-based, so it's something that other people value in the market, your customers will value. Um, and then the second part of it, the reason I say uh, that you should be passionate about solving it 
is that um, there's, life is too short. There's plenty of things you could do. You want to do something that you're passionate about, where you're going to have an impact, and that you're really going to um, put yourself fully into it. So um, if you have an, a couple different ideas, pick the one that you're most passionate about. Uh, and you know, if you haven't found that one yet, that's OK. But uh, you know, really make sure that you're passionate about what you're, you're working on, because I think you're going to do a lot better, uh, and you'll have a lot better solution uh, with that part of it as well. The second theme is focusing on addressing a customer pain. Right? So this is, um, in order for your a solution to a problem to be valuable, it really has to be something that's based in customer needs. And sometimes uh, customers know they, they, they need this type of solution. Sometimes they don't. And you can come up with um, a solution that, that helps uh, you know, address uh, you know, or, or deliver a solution in a way that maybe they hadn't thought of. Uh, that's OK, too. But really, it needs to be um, grounded and, and centered towards customers. Um, one of the talks yesterday uh, focused on how uh, it, the uh, tough the needle presentation. They talked about how they actually um, are, you know, um, really focused on getting customer feedback, incorporating that into their products, and continually to iterate and improve. That's focusing on um, on addressing customer pain. And the last theme that I'll touch on is starting small. So start with something that you can manage and bite off, but think big. Think about solving um, really big problems. And I'll talk a little bit about. Um, how uh, you know, all of these themes relate to, to what we do at Digital Globe, but also are very relevant uh, whether you're starting your own company or join another company um, and whether you're working as part of a startup-like initiative within the business. So just um, Ryan had a great introduction, so I won't spend too much time, but just a minute about uh, my background, just kind of visualize this way. So um, as I said, I was an IST student here. And um, I graduated in, uh, from Penn State in 2005. Um, I knew that I didn't know exactly um, what type of career path I wanted to take or what, what the specific job title might be when I was an IST student. But I knew I wanted to uh, use technology to solve problems and, and do that in business. And so um, I you know, had a great experience in IST. I learned a lot about technology uh, and, um, and different business challenges. And so I had an opportunity to, to join Merrill Lynch uh, and work in a role where I was essentially advising uh, companies on both their financial, uh, financial strategy as well as um, their kind of competitive strategies in the market and identify ways to, to grow their, their businesses. And so um, that actually helped um, enable an opportunity in venture capital uh, where I was an associate with FirstMark Capital, helping to identify companies to invest in. Uh, working on actual deals when we had a deal to execute, and then as well as working with uh, portfolio companies. And you know, it's funny how one opportunity really builds on the next, and uh, one thing leads to the next. So, Spadac, uh, which I joined in 2010, uh, was a portfolio company of FirstMark Capital. Uh, portfolio company means that this is a company where FirstMark had an investment. So I worked closely with the management team for the three years that I was part of FirstMark. Uh, and then um, really was passionate about what the business was doing, um, welcomed the opportunity to join the team and have an impact, and so um, managed to, uh, to, to land a role at Spadac. And then um, uh, later that year, we actually um, we merged the business with GUI. Um, and then in 2013, uh, GUI was acquired by Digital Globe. And so what's unique about the next uh, phase of my career progression and so with Spadec was very focused on uh, predictive analytics and mapping those, um, those predictions. Digital Globe and GOI had a, a heritage around um, collecting high resolution uh, Earth imagery or satellite imagery. And so what was really unique about the opportunity was the ability to put these things together. So I'll tell you a little bit about how that, wor that works. Uh, and so the other thing that was really neat about both these companies, even though uh, they were GOI uh, was in Digital Globe, is uh, a publicly traded company, they really have the roots uh, that founded around kind of a startup uh, philosophy, right? So um, these companies came out of um, an era where uh, satellite imagery was something only that um, military uh, and defense or intelligence customers uh, were able to use. And so um, you know, with the advent of technologies like Google Earth, um, as well as the content from providers such as GUI and Digital Globe, um, this imagery really became accessible to the masses, right? And so 
um, that enabled a whole variety of, of new ways to think about problems both within uh, the defense and intelligence space, but also then within the commercial sector. And so um, uh, in Digital Globe was uh, founded uh, in 1992 by Walter Scott. And you know, really, um, I think it, it's a great example of starting small, but really thinking big. I mean, to, to, um, to think about where you could put a satellite up in space and, uh, uh, you know, and then be able to collect images of the Earth to help answer questions for people. That's really thinking big, but it's rooted around um, a very much of a startup uh, type of philosophy. So um, just a minute about Digital Globe to, um, to provide you some context, and it will only be, um, I promise, only two slides of background. But I think it's really important um, to talk about our vision. So Digital Globe's vision is by 2020 to be the indispensable source of information about our changing planet. That's also thinking big. It's important, though, for companies to, uh, to really know what their, their purpose, vision, and, and values are. Um, think about these things every day. And think about how everything that you do in that day should tie back to one of these, um, you know, either your, your broader vision or your values in your company. And so um, the way that, that we're doing that today is, um, so we have uh, imagery archive uh, covers the globe uh, eight times and counting. We refresh uh, imagery over the land mass of the earth, um, about 60% of the land mass land mass of the earth um, every month and you can see what a um, what 30 days of, of imagery collection look like and we have um, the combined constellation of GUI and digital globe as part of the new digital globe uh, we have um, five high resolution imagery satellites we'll launch our next satellite um, the middle of this year and so I mean this is phenomenal I mean, there's uh, you know being able to have access to this amount of data uh, really en enables you to help answer questions in a more timely and a bigger way. And so when we think about big data and analytics, these are the type of um, enablers that allow you to, to do those things. So going back to how I started out, uh, you know, I said, well, so can you find Waldo in the picture, right? And so we think about that problem a little bit differently, but it's, a, it's in some ways a very similar type of challenge. Uh, so we think about, well, how do you find things in satellite imagery? And so there's a variety of techniques to do this. Uh, there's expert imagery analysts that, uh, you know, that um, have techniques, photogrammetry techniques that know sort of how to analyze an image and, and uh, identify features and so forth and extract information. Um, we have some algorithms that we can, uh, for certain types of, of objects like f buildings or cars, we can actually do what's called automatic feature extraction. And so um, the other way um, was something that a startup um, that I first um, got introduced to uh, about three years ago uh, called Tomnod was thinking about, and it's crowdsourcing. So um, it's kind of good old fashioned having a lot of people look at the imagery, identify um, objects that are things that they're looking at, things that they believe that to be what they're looking for, and then we can really help to narrow the space and then have expert analysts look at those things further. So, uh, you know, Tom Nod, um, the backstory for this company, um, to be clear, I was actually not part of the startup company, but um, we acquired this company last year and they're now part of Digital Globe, really driving innovation around crowdsourcing for our company. But what's really neat about this story um, is that the, the, I had a, a first chance to interact with the, the team of entrepreneurs here. They were actually uh, graduate students uh, in a PhD program. And this picture, uh, they're um, trekking across Mongolia, uh, and their research project was searching for the tomb of Genghis Khan. And so uh, this was something that, this was a National Geographic uh, supported expedition. But what was different about this team of researchers is they said, well, look, I mean, this is a, a vast space, really challenging problem. There was some historical records, but there was a lot of missing information. And so they needed a way as a team, a small team of researchers to be able to, uh, to, to really have a force multiplier to answer these sort of questions. So um, they used a lot of different innovative technology. They used drones. Uh, they also then used satellite imagery uh, that our company's foundation actually granted to them uh, so uh, as a, um, a research grant. So um, 
I also mention this because if any of you are working on research projects in the room and have an idea and are interested in um, grant, uh, getting a, um, a grant of satellite imagery, there's been some really, really cool research projects that have come out of that. And so you can make a request. Um, and you know, if um, your application is accepted, then we can uh, either provide you know, uh, imagery from our archive um, or potentially um, you know, even uh, be able to provide new imagery that's collected to help answer that, that research question. So definitely um, look into that or ask me about it if you have um, questions. And so this team, as I said, um, they wanted to use the power of the crowd. So they had this imagery um, that was donated by our foundation. But the real kind of power behind it was that they put this out for citizen explorers on National Geographic to be able to, uh, to dive in and really help participate in this hunt. And so you notice these icons um, on the side of the screen here. They, um, they talk about different features uh, that the team of researchers uh, was attempting to identify. Uh, they provided sample images of what these features might look like from the satellite. And then they opened it up and let the crowds go in and identify these features. So a great project. Uh, you can actually watch a special. Uh, there was a special that aired uh, at one point on the National Geographic channel. So it's still uh, is available, I believe, as well. And so if you want to learn more about this, check it out online or check out the, uh, the National Geographic documentary. So this team, though, um, after they finished this, this project, they said, well, you know, this would be great. We could actually, this, this idea of crowdsourcing and imagery analysis, um, this is something that you know, we could build a company from. So they started a company, this company called Tomnod, um, which I believe means uh, big eyes uh, in, uh, in Mongolia. And so kind of the eye in the sky with, with the satellites. Um, and um, I actually had a chance to, uh, I, I met the team, I believe, you know, through um, the work of our foundation. But then also, um, this was a picture at their, uh, the startup incubator that this team, uh, where they were working in San Diego, where they were building out uh, you know, the, the early days of this product. And um, they were working closely uh, with a number of, of imaging companies in the space. But really, we're, we're focused on how do we identify and extract uh, features from imagery at scale. So um, fast forward into, um, to about a month ago, there was, um, I saw a, um, a flash notification, a push notification that came through on my iPhone that there was a, a missing Malaysian airline plane, and um, as did the, the Tom Knott team um, who I, I work closely with. And the wheel started turning of, hey, this is, um, there's been a number of, of uh, natural disaster events where the Tom Knott team has deployed this capability to, to for example, um, map the devastation of tornadoes in Moore, Oklahoma. And that's been great for relief workers. We've also help, helped to locate, um, there were some missing climbers in South America. And so the, uh, when MH370 went missing, this seemed like a very logical place to, to utilize this capability. So if you go to TomNod.com, uh, this is the, the page that you'll see, and you can, you can sign up. Uh, is, has anyone in the room had a chance to, to check this out yet or, or sign up? Cool. Well, if, uh, you, thanks for your participation. We appreciate it. Uh, and uh, you know, if you have a chance, uh, check it out, and uh, you can volunteer to, to help search for, for evidence of this, the missing flight. And so the way that the interface was configured here, uh, as I said, we identified uh, various kind of examples of what debris or, or objects of interest might look like. And then we open up this imagery. So we, we serve it up in um, essentially bite-sized chunks to, to not overwhelm the user. Because the ocean, this is a vast space. right? So you want to give uh, people imagery that is a manageable size and that they can essentially then focus and, and look at that area and try to identify um, the, these type of objects. And so um, you know, we thought, well, this is something you know, maybe some people will want to help out with this. And, and that would be great. And so, well, it turns out a lot of people wanted to help out with this. Um, we, the, the day uh, or a day or two after it launched, um, we made the front page of CNN.com. You can see volunteers pour over satellite um, images. And so um, the, the response has, frankly, been amazing. Uh, the, the founders, um, so a couple of the, the co-founders, uh, Shai Harnoy, Luke Barrington, uh, Nate Rickland, they've all been closely involved with this, this effort. They, um, I turned on the Today Show one, one day. and um, I saw Carson Daly explaining how Tomnod works, which was, was really cool. It's kind of neat to, 
to see, um, you know, when the things that you work on, and, and you sometimes, uh, you know, you feel like they're very specific to the industry, but when you, when you see that this is a way for a lot of people that, to help out and engage in this problem, that, that, that's really rewarding. Um, another, another kind of um, funny, funny story related to this, so um, it turns out that Courtney Love also uh, decided to, um, to pitch in and help out, and so she actually tweeted this out from her account. Um, it's maybe a little bit hard to see with the, the projector, but she found uh, some items that she suspected to be potential debris um, and annotated uh, the, the image chip that she identified. Um, and actually signed it, CL, and, um, and then tweeted it, and our team our, took a look there. It turns out that, that it actually um, was, was not any debris, but we appreciate her help as well. And so it's just really neat to, to see how you know, even celebrities um, are, uh, you know, decided to, to engage in this effort. And so it's really great to be able to, to have an impact like that. And so let me talk a little bit just about, so, so what, what has the impact been, and, and how, um, you know, what are some numbers behind that? So, We've had 8 million visitors to Tomnod in the last month. There's, uh, there's about uh, 911,000 registered email accounts that signed up. And so what does all that translate to? That translates to uh, 775 million map views, 15 million tags placed, over 760,000 square kilometers of satellite imagery that has been examined by the crowd. And we had to stand up um, 500 Amazon web servers to support that. So just phenomenal. I mean, th these, are, um, you know, these are phenomenal numbers. I think at, at the peak, we're, we're, doing, um, we're serving about two times the number of images, I think, that, that uh, a site like Instagram serves. So um, you know, th for us, this is, uh, you know, we're, we're very, really focused right now on um, geospatial big data and enabling these kind of analytics. So this is a great example of um, of that actually in action. And this is all something that, you know, as I s said when I started, that this is a startup company um, that really, it will, now is part of Digital Globe, um, but has, uh, has really had an impact. Uh, so as you think about different opportunities, uh, this is something that, you know, if you, um, if you have your own idea and want to start a company, that's phenomenal. You should, you should go do that. Now's a great time to. Uh, but if you, um, you know, you may also be able to, um, to find some of these type of things uh, within the context of a larger company as well. So the next topic um, that I want to talk about is we talked about um, how can we find Waldo, uh, in, in air quotes, uh, in an image. So how about this question? Can we predict where uh, Waldo might go? And so, um, well, actually sort of yes. And so um, the company that I joined after um, I, I worked at Firstmark, which was one of the portfolio companies, Spadac, was focused on, on just that, understanding patterns of life, understanding how we can anticipate where things or where people or um, where objects are likely to be um, by analyzing data and essentially building statistical models. So um, the example that I want to talk a little bit about today, um, this is an organization that uh, Digital Globe supports. Um, it's the, the problem is related to, uh, to uh, some of the issues right now that are, are happening in the southern part of, of Sudan. And so the organization that we support uh, is called the, the Satellite Sentinel Project. And uh, definitely uh, an interesting organization to check out when you have a chance. Um, but this is um, an organization that actually um, George Clooney has been very active in supporting. He's actually um, gone on the ground and seen uh, what's happening in person. But essentially, um, the, the Sudanese army is attacking a variety of villages um, and rebel forces. And um, you, see, um, you can see some of this from imagery here, but you can also then, to get a, a picture on the ground, um, you can see that how villages can be are destroyed and, and raised. And so, um, we were asked to help uh, analyze this problem, and so we've provided satellite imagery uh, that shows some of, of, of these acts, um, but then we also wanted to use the power of our predictive uh, modeling as well. And so um, when we focused on this part, it's, um, you can see here's Sudan. This is the southern portion of Sudan, and then you have actually South Sudan uh, below there on the screen. And so the way that um, the SPADAC technology works is we essentially build a, um, a statistical model, and then we map the output of that model. So you'll see um, different maps that have what's called a heat map, and it shows, you know, um, often they're showing clusters of events. What we're trying to do is we build a statistical model 
that helps us anticipate where a similar event is likely to occur based on all the, um, the geospatial similarities. And what that means is these could be um, you know, anywhere from uh, the physical infrastructure, the human geography of a place, and then that help all of that data gets fed in and it's, uh, we're essentially looking at that in relation to known event locations. In this case, we have a variety of um, different types of attacks ranging from uh, you know, uh, ground attacks to artillery to aerial bombardment. Uh, and so we built this statistical model. This is all open source data. Um, so uh, this is all, you know, all data that can be publicly uh, analyzed and shown. And so we built this model. And so what was interesting, obviously the locations where um, previous attacks have occurred, if your model is working correctly, you'll have an attack there because it's trained off of those points. Uh, really interesting is when you find these spaces that are non-contiguous or not connected to the locations of existing attacks. And so this the area uh, in Delami that you, that's uh, circled there, you'll notice that that's an area that's of potential interest because there haven't been any previous attacks there. We'll fast forward a little bit. Um, so it turns out there, there was actually an attack that ended up happening there. Um, it happened about uh, 200 meters off of where our signature showed. Uh, and so what was interesting is that um, this, there were t actually two people killed uh, in this attack. Uh, the, the village and a lot of the, the medical uh, infrastructure and supply and buildings were, were destroyed. Uh, and no other attack had occurred within 48 kilometers of this previous attack. So being able to provide information like this to decision makers really helps to answer questions of you know, where to look if you're pointing satellites to observe these type of things, uh, you know, potentially where to, to deploy resources, and, and really kind of how to get ahead of these, these problems. And so um, you know, this capability around predictive modeling, predictive analytics, um, this is something that really started um, as part of a startup as SPADAC. And um, as we think about our business today, we're really focused around, we have data, which is primarily satellite imagery. We have our information products, uh, which help um, you know, uh, many of you use every day when you, when you use various um, mapping software. It's a lot of that's our imagery. And then we have our insight products, which really help answer important questions for decision makers. So in, in wrapping up, I wanted, wanted to, to recap um, the three themes I talked about. So the first one is, you know, if you're thinking about whether, you know, it's um, for us, uh, you know, a, um, an initiative within our company, uh, whether we're incubating a new product or bringing um, a startup uh, into our business and then thinking about how that can, um, can uh, help our business grow and accelerate growth, uh, it's really about identifying a valuable market problem and then having a team like, for example, the team at SPADAC or the, the Tomna team, you can see the passion uh, that you know, when people started these companies, they were really focused on helping to solve really important, valuable problems that are going to have an impact. And then focusing on addressing the customer needs, uh, you know, this is something that, uh, that you want to make sure that your, um, your solutions are really have, have the customer in focus and we really understand what the customer's needs are. So do, um, doing a thoughtful analysis of that um, is always important too, because sometimes customers will think they need one thing, but they weren't aware that you know, well, you could actually you know, provide um, the solution through another capability that you have. And then the last point is, you know, start off small with something that you're going to be able to execute on and be able to get going, but then having the bigger vision uh, to go out and really have an impact in the world, I think, um, you know, it's, there's plenty of examples of people um, both um, that, you know, I've been lucky enough to have a chance to work with as well as people um, that are some of them are classmates or some other, you know, alums of the college as well that have really, um, you know, uh, you know, been able to go out in the real world and do this. So um, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate uh, you guys uh, joining me on a, a Friday morning. And uh, I'm excited to take any questions that you have.
would, for example, find the fund money from the airline? Absolutely. Yeah, Dave, thank you very much for the question. So to elaborate a little bit on how Tomnod works, there's um, a couple of really interesting components. So uh, the, the idea of crowdsourcing is, is not unique, right? There's uh, many different types of crowdsourcing. And so what's really unique about Tomnod is how first being able to, to focus a crowd uh, as a, and you know, to, to go out and really um, help the crowd uh, have an understanding of the problem, get quickly up to speed, and then, as David said, be able to separate the signal from the noise. And so the way that uh, we're able to do that with Tomnod uh, is there's actually an algorithm that runs on the back end of Tomnod called CrowdRank. And what it looks at is it looks at the, all the contributions of an individual user and it scores them um, against the broader contributions of, um, of the, the crowd. And also then it scores them against um, validated points that we have. So we can essentially identify uh, statistically one, how, uh, how potentially accurate an individual com contributor is, but then also um, for where there's a group of contributions, um, potentially you know, uh, how accurate that is. So in the case of, of MH370, um, it's obviously a vast space that we're searching. So having a lot of eyeballs uh, is, is really um, necessary to do that. Uh, but the other challenge is that there's that many things in the, uh, the ocean that appear as objects that may or may not be and really what for us, what this is capability has, has helped us do is uh, narrow the space down so that there's no way that all of our, um, that our imagery analysts could, could look at um, the vast space that, um, that the volunteers have been able to examine. But what we can do is that we can boil that down um, to, to uh, points that are higher, statistically higher uh, likelihood of being something that we should look at, then that really helps us to focus th that analysis. So um, it, w the, the, the short answer is half meter resolution. And what that means is one pixel on your screen is about um, the size of home plate on a baseball diamond. So uh, now let me maybe elaborate on that a little bit more. Uh, there's there's different, different sensors, so different satellites. Uh, we call them sensors. They have, um, think of them as kind of big digital cameras in space, right? They have, uh, depending on um, when they were built, uh, what their specifications were, they have different resolutions. Uh, so right now, uh, within the U.S., uh, for commercial purposes, uh, we are, uh, so we have a, a license to provide satellite imagery with, with NOAA. And um, NOAA, right now, we, we are, our limit is half meter. So we have sensors um, that, and you can read about the specifications, uh, where we're actually, the sensor is, the native resolution is higher than half meter, but because of the way, um, right, right now the restrictions that, uh, the commercial restrictions that are placed on us um, by the government, we have to, to sample that, you know, to half meter. And so um, that's something that, um, you know, we've, um, it's come up uh, in a number of, um, of questions in, in different public forums. Um, we're, we're lobbying to actually having that resolution restriction lowered. Uh, a couple reasons. Um, one reason is that our international competition is not limited um, to the, the same resolution restrictions. Uh, the other reason uh, is that um, uh, aerial uh, imagery, so if you look at um, imagery over the U.S. or Western Europe, those are two areas where there tends to be a lot of aerial photography, and um, that type of imagery is, is not limited uh, in the resolution. Now, it obviously is harder to, uh, to deploy uh, an airplane um, any place around the globe, and there's plenty of places where it's either not feasible uh, just due to distance and, and accessibility or um, due to uh, you know, geopolitical uh, issues where you can't fly an airplane over that place. But, um, so uh, right now the answer, though, is, is half meter resolution, which uh, you know is still, um, is still has phenomenal quality and um, you, know, you can, uh, in the ocean, the challenge is that it's, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different, uh, you know, so, sometimes uh, you may have a, a great image in this part of the world, it tends to be a cloud uh, belt, a cloud covered area. So uh, you know, that, that's a limitation that we have as well. So we try to, to image and, and re-image those areas. Uh, there are some other things that um, uh, we're expanding more are, are um, 
one of our sensors, Worldview 2, does have the ability to do what we call multispectral. So we can actually um, collect different uh, parts of, the, of the, um, the, the spectrum and then be able to uh, uh, you know, do different types of imagery analysis where we can um, potentially identify different types of objects. Our next satellite um, will have more capabilities in that regard. And so um, really think about it this way. It's more data. So then uh, it may not be something that a crowd could necessarily take advantage of all these different bands. Uh, but uh, you know, from an expert imagery standpoint, uh, imagery analyst standpoint, um, it's really powerful data. Yeah, so sure, sure. Happy to. D So um, I, l let me maybe tackle a couple of those like uh, basic questions around just how that how satellites our satellites work. So um, we own and operate our satellites. We do not build them. Um, so our current satellite, uh, World V3, is being built by Ball Aerospace. Um, so uh, a few months ago, I had a chance. Uh, they're they're based in. Um, we're based in. Uh, our, our headquarters is um, north of Denver, Colorado, uh, in a town called Longmont. Um, the the place where uh, where Worldview uh, 3 is being uh, assembled is actually right down the street in, near Boulder. Um, and uh, so uh, you know, we help uh, provide the specifications for that, um, kind of what the requirements are based on the customer needs and so forth. And then um, it's actually, uh, you know, there's different components that are integrated. Uh, and so once that's assembled, then um, you know, it's transported to a launch site. and um, that once the satellite's launched, then uh, we essentially take ownership of it. And then um, in order to communicate with that satellite, we have um, what's uh, known as uh, ground stations or ground terminals that when the satellite passes over, we can communicate and, and essentially downlink and then provide new tasking instructions to do that. So um, in terms of maintenance, um, these things are built to last. Uh, you, you can't go up and fix it. <laughs> and so uh, it's, it's really important that there's, um, I mean, you can imagine, and I really only gained an appreciation for this of actually seeing uh, the satellite. But um, I mean, when you launch something into space, there's a tremendous amount of, um, of force on that. Um, you know, you've got to factor in things like, like the temperature of having this sensor live in space. I mean, there's, ex you know, extreme temperatures. Um, you know, there's uh, just literally the vibration from the launch. And so um, while these are, are um, you know, very highly tuned, precise instruments, um, they're also really built to last. And so um, there is um, you know, a lot of innovation in the space. Uh, we have competition as well that um, you, you may have read or heard articles about. Uh, there's a trend right now of, of microsatellites. Um, it, you know, it's an interesting space where uh, companies are um, working to um, build lower cost satellites and deploy more of them. Uh, and so, um, you know, there's definitely uh, that a little bit different part of the market than where we serve. Uh, you know, one of the, the limitations of that type of technology is the actual accuracy. So when you get a, a, an image off the satellite, is it map accurate? In other words, um, if you were to go out with your GPS and stand and use that image, would the image line up to where you actually are on the Earth? And so, um, uh, you know, some degree of error is okay, but for some applications, right, like that could mean the difference of life and death. So um, it's, uh, there's you know, different imagery for different types of application and different commercial purposes. But um, you know, we, we really serve um, kind of a very high resolution, high accuracy part of the market and customers that demand those characteristics. Go ahead. Uh, so um, maybe a, a quick clarification, and um, and I'll provide some some context on that too. So uh, so we we do a lot of open source analysis. So when we look to solve a problem, we we analyze information that's freely available, open source. Um, our imagery tends to be we, we do provide um, imagery in the case of, for example, like a um, you know um, a natural disaster or, or if there's a humanitarian uh, issue as well, but uh, you know, generally speaking, the imagery that um, that you might consume 
that's provided by Digital Globe. It would generally come through. So if you're like uh, logging into um, a mapping application or using location-based services app on your your smartphone, that imagery has actually been. Um, it's it's not really open source. It's been been paid for um, by a customer. Now it's um, all of the imagery is um, is probably a more accurate word is, is shareable, right? So um, this is imagery that's all unclassified imagery. So what's actually really interesting about that for both commercial and, uh, and you know, uh, uh, defense uses is that it's completely shareable, right? So um, increasingly there's, uh, you know, global partners that we, we work with whenever, um, you know, sort of challenges arise. So being able to share imagery in a very accessible and timely way is, is a powerful characteristic of that. So has anyone in the room um, actually started a company or thinking about starting a company? Great. Go ahead, question back. I have not read the book, but uh, can, okay. Cool. Uh, thank you for the tip. I definitely will we'll check that out. L let me actually take, if we have a, a minute, to just take a quick poll. Um, so there was a few people that are, are starting companies or thinking about starting companies. Uh, you know, how many of you uh, you uh, have an interest in kind of working on startup-like things, but you know, have, don't necessarily uh, you know either. You know, don't have an idea for a startup or don't plan to start a company, but would like to pursue that type of work maybe within um, a, another organization. Okay, great. Well, I mean, I think um, you know, part of what I wanted to talk about today is really just um, expanding your aperture of, of, of uh, you know, things that you could think about doing with your IST degree. I think that's one of the great things that I learned was that um, the degree is really flexible and that um, you know, there's a fair amount of, you, there's, it's a great curriculum, but it's very problem-centric and problem-based. And so you can, um, you know, it gives you the latitude to really think outside your major. Uh, and I think you'll find that there's, um, you know, that your major provides the, the foundation for the, the skill set that you have and that knowledge base. But then, um, as you'll hear from many of the speakers, that there's, I think, really, really interesting things when you take what you know from this major but apply it into another space and solve a problem. And uh, you know, you may not know where that um, that that space or what that space is or where it might lead you. But um, I think really, uh, you know, some of the most interesting ideas in startups uh, come out of uh, sort of the uh, the unconventional wisdom, right? And in, in bringing that solution to um, a market that maybe hasn't uh, used that capability in the past. Any other questions before we wrap up? I will thank you again. Uh, really appreciate everyone joining me uh, on Friday morning and uh, look forward to meeting you individually. And feel, please feel free to come up if you have any questions. Thank you.